the December stakes, and boy, they were dreadful. I wish I could remember specifics, but uh, I remember making a note that I thought that the, you know, that was kind of a negative. I'm, I'm pretty much across the board, but we've seen some of the horses that have come back run well, including Group e Doll herself. So, um, you know, obviously that might bode well for uh, for some success for horses like Executive Privilege and, of course, Dustin Diamonds. We mentioned before, we're now pleased to be joined by thoroughbred horse trainer Mike Maker joins us from Louisville, Kentucky. Mike, welcome to the show. Robert Lee and Gene Wood with you. We appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks for having me. Hey, uh, morning, Mike. Mike, over 900 career wins, your 12th nationally in earnings this year, over $6.6 .6 million in earnings. You really added to that total with a huge day at the Claiming Crown on Saturday at Gulfstream. You had four winners in the seven races. Now you're the all-time winningest trainer in the event's history. How nice is it to be able to run these hard-knocking horses for such big purses? Oh, obviously, it's, it's great. Uh, you know, it gives, uh, you know, horses a... Uh, Claiming a, a, their day in the sun, so uh, uh, obviously not just because of wind, but I thought uh, Coldstream had a fabulous day. And obviously, the you know the I think that the the claiming crown really kind of kicked off the meet very well there. It's a time of year when there's kind of a dearth of graded stakes races anyhow, and it seems like it kind of a is a is a nice spot and on the calendar. And obviously. Um, you know, I'm sure after having spent some uh, claiming crown days at, you know, tracks like Canterbury, that, you know, an afternoon at Gulfstream Park in the sunshine, probably not a, uh, not a bad thing. Uh, if it were to find a permanent home at the, uh, at the Gulfstream meeting at the open, uh, opening weekend of Gulfstream, uh, would, that, uh, would, that be a big, uh, would that be a big hardship for you? Not really. We're stable there, so it's, it's, it's not bad at all. But I tell you what is all the claiming crowns I've been to, uh, Seemed like they had the biggest crowd in the fullest field, so uh, I would think it's found a new home. Mike, is uh, the claiming crown something you've got in mind at the end of the year when you claim some horses throughout the year and maybe sort of point them to this event? Yeah, it does. Uh, you know, when we claim horses, we always you know, try to see how we can get return on the investment. And if the horse is eligible, that kind of you know, means more to a to a pro if the horse pans out, so absolutely. And a reasonable amount of that uh, claiming success in recent years, of course, has come with the uh, familiar Ramsey colors. Uh, tell us a little bit, Mike, about your partnership with Ken Ramsey. I think it's, it's fair to say most of our, our viewers are familiar with, uh, with Mr. Ramsey. He's a very, very active claiming guy. He likes to play the horses. He's very involved. Um, What's it like working for a guy like him and with a guy like that, as opposed to somebody who says, "Here's here's the here's the books, here's the accounts, go in and pick some horses." Um, you know, he he's very knowledgeable. Uh, you, know, you tell him like it is. He understands the game, and uh, you know, from claiming to to breeding, uh, you know, he's he's a big asset on my side, not only just as a client, but just because of his knowledge and. Uh, you know, it's, it's just really enjoy working for the guy. And obviously his enthusiasm is second to none. And uh, he, if you watch him win a 5,000 claimer, you you know, he's got the same reaction as if he <laughs> won the Dubai World Cup. So uh, you got to love that. And he's won the Dubai World <laughs> Cup. <laughs> and he's won plenty of five claimers as well. And, yes, he, he does look every bit as enthusiastic, especially if it's a situation where he's cashed a bet. I know he's also a big player in the pick six. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's another, uh, another side of the game in addition to breeding and, and standing the tremendous stallion kitten's joy and really supporting him. He's been active on so many levels, so obviously a, a terrific guy to have in the game and certainly one that's got a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of parts of the game. Mike, let's watch a couple of, sorry about that. Let's watch a couple of wins that you had on Saturday. We're going to start off with the $200,000 claiming crown jewel. We're going to pick it up at the top of the stretch. Your horse is number four, Parents Honor, under Alan Garcia, who you claimed back in August at Saratoga. Parents Honor makes a terrific run here in the red cap, uh, sort of behind a wall of horses right now. Splits horses to win. Talk a little bit about his effort. Well, it's what we've been looking for uh... I was high on the horse since uh, we've got him, obviously, from looking at where we placed him. And, uh, you know, the horse was sprint when we got him. And, uh, you know, he's a big, grand-looking horse. And um, I felt two turns with the uh, move the horse way up. And uh, when I ran him in the stake at Mountaineer, I was, it, it was a competitive race, but I was very disappointed in his performance and 
couldn't figure out why, and uh, he finally showed up on Saturday. And this is a horse that's actually relatively light off the claim. As you said, Robert was claimed in Saratoga for $30,000, claimed out of a winning performance, one that I remember well because I happened to select him that day, and uh, then headed down to Louisiana Downs of all places. So this has been a horse that's been kind of around, faced uh, the likes of Delaney and Gantry and Good Lord last time out, um, fairly lightly raced. Was this a horse that when you took this horse up at Saratoga that the plan was to, you know, just kind of carefully nurse him along to this event? A little bit. Uh, one, uh, like I'm dropping in for 35000 And, uh, you know, like I said, it did make him eligible, but that wasn't the sole reason we took him. He just looked like a nice, honest, hard, hard knocking horse. Mike, another win you had early on the card was with Bernie the Maestro. We're going to watch his stretch run here as well and the rapid transit stakes. He is number 13. He stalked the pace from the outside. He drew off to win. Was that a professional effort that you were looking for from him? Yeah, really. Uh, we, we had gotten out shook on this horse a couple times in the past, and uh, we finally got him and uh, was, was grateful. He's been a big fan of this horse, and uh, I think he's got a big year ahead of him. You, uh, you actually answered my, uh, my next question, Mike. I was going to ask you about the claim on this horse because uh, just glancing down at his past performances, he's been very live at the claim box. This horse was, uh, you know, was, uh, was going from barn to barn on the Naira circuit for quite some time, was reclaimed by a couple of guys. I was going to ask if you had maybe uh, tried to get him earlier yep, or not. Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he was one that was a, a very popular horse in New York and, and is now a 12-time winner, which, you know, when they carry that form from barn to barn is certainly a positive. Now, he was claimed also at Saratoga. Only one race in the interim. That was at Keeneland. It was a victory on the synthetic there. Again, uh, rather than moving this horse uh, around a lot, was just kind of carefully managed for, uh, you know, potentially a spot here down at Gulfstream Park. And this is a horse who had run well at Gulfstream before. Well, you notice uh, he's never had a break in his career. And uh, when we got him, uh, he knew he was eligible and uh, Basically, we were pointing towards claiming crowns, so my idea when I got him was just to fresh him up and so forth. And, uh, you know, it looks like the time between races really uh, moves him up. Mike. Because the last two races have been very strong, in my opinion. Mike, you're a very sharp trainer when it comes to claiming horses. That's really something uh, that you excel in. Do you really enjoy the chess mass at match aspect of that profession? Yeah, I do. Uh, but. You know, there again, uh, you know, I enjoy all, you know, aspects of the game. Uh, you know, with Mr. Ramsey, obviously, some of his premieres and stuff. I'm a good, uh, you know, maybe a mare that I've trained or something to get the baby in. That's always, uh, you know, I really enjoy that, too. So it's not just claiming I like all parts of it. A top horse in your barn right now, one of the top horses, uh, is Joe Ha, who won the grade one uh, Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland, but has run poorly in his last two starts. What are your plans with Joe Ha? Uh, he went to the farm for some freshening and uh, looked towards a three-year-old campaign. And he's a horse that did well early on in the year on, uh, on turf, uh, was very successful as well at Keeneland on the synthetic. Is he a horse you're going to try and switch back to the main track, or do you think you're going to stay with the uh, with either the turf or synthetic? We'll probably uh, stick to the turf and synthetic right now. Yes. Uh, you know, the experiment we tried at uh, Churchill didn't pan out, and there's some nice uh, synthetic races coming up, so I think we're going to go that direction. Obviously, with uh, with big races in the uh, in the spring, including the bluegrass, yep. which is <laughs> about as big a race as you're going to find consistently run on the synthetic. That looks like a uh, you know a pretty nice option for a horse like that. It was a good early two year old, and looks to be one that uh, maybe coming back off a of freshening will sharpen right up as a uh, an early three year old as well. Yes. Mike, what are your plans? Uh, let's ask you about another one of your horses, King David, uh, who you claimed and then went on to win the Grade One Jamaica. What are your plans with him? Uh, I think we're going to uh, space his race a little further apart, maybe point to the Connelly Turf Cup at uh, Sam Houston. And that's uh, that's another horse that was a, a terrific claim. I mean, we you know we were talking about the horses that were claimed uh, this year and ended up winning races like the Claiming Crown events. But uh, this was a horse that you claimed and turned around, and at a big price pulled off the upset in the uh, in the Grade One Jamaica. Uh, when you're looking for a horse like that, you know, when you're claiming horses, say you know, when these horses mainly in the thirty thirty five thousand dollar range, do you have stakes in mind, or are you just kind of hoping to get a good horse? 
a little of both. I mean, you always like to dream in this game, so uh, yeah, went that direction. But really, the timing of the race was good. I mean, obviously, he was a horse that uh, loved to be in the winner's circle. Uh, we actually entered him in a starter lounge race that failed to fill, and uh, I had him nominated uh, to the Jamaica. And when that race was coming up a short field and uh, yielding turf course, uh, figured why not take a shot if we uh, run third in there. He, uh, Mr. Barney would get all his investment back and uh, be happy. So uh, actually, well, we talked got a lot better than that. <laughs> <laughs> we talked to Ken McPeak over the uh, over the summertime, and he was talking a little bit about his uh, his uh, dead heat Travers winner golden ticket, and said, "Yeah, they, they you know they were looking at an overnight race or an allowance race, and it didn't fill, so they just decided, hey, what the heck, we'll run in the Travers <laughs> instead." Um, and obviously, that panned out very well, as did uh, as did the move into the Jamaica for you. And and sometimes it just points out that if you can find perhaps you know, what looks like maybe a little bit of a weak spot or a vulnerability in the stake schedule. Uh, and in the, you know, the case of the Jamaica, it appeared that, you know, the, the hurdle you had to climb was Dolahan and, the, you know, you had some questions about him on the yielding turf course. And, um, you know, it, it made perfect sense. And I think it, it just points out the reason that you really kind of need to keep your eyes open and keep the condition book uh, in your back pocket all the time, which is uh, clearly something that you and Mr. Ramsey are both doing. Right. Mike, uh, this past season you were probably best known as the trainer of Hanson, the two-year-old champion from last year. A very easy horse to spot, a big gray horse. Talk about the ride he took you on this season, including the Kentucky Derby. That was great, obviously, being a two-year-old champion. Um, it's our first uh, Clips Award winner, so that was uh, you know, a very special day. And, uh, you know, going to the Kentucky Derby and, you know, just a... Uh, you know, very privileged again to be able to train him and uh, hopefully he goes on and has a successful stallion career. Mike, you're, uh, let's talk a little bit about your career. You're the son of a trainer. Your dad was a trainer. Is this a profession that you always knew you wanted to do? Yeah, it sure was. Uh, you know, calling him to the track. and uh, you know, That was it. There was never, never a question uh, since I was probably five, six years old. Yeah, I was reading your bio uh, online at your website, and it said you actually owned horses when you were a teenager. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I think I was 12 or 13, and uh, my dad would go to, Tim I think it was Timonium, they had, uh, or Bowie or something, they had uh, some cheap horses he raced in Detroit. And he came back with a horse, I think, he gave 2500 for, and, you know, I was making big money walking horses, living at home for free, and <laughs> delivering newspapers, so I... Uh, and he got my six hundred dollars, and uh, I did ride him right back for four thousand, and he won. And I thought it was an easy game after that. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to. I'll have to have you have a conversation with my uh, my twelve year old son, who doesn't seem to have any interest in horses. The only thing he wants to to use his uh, his let's just say, you know, his allowance money for is to buy bicycle parts. And I'm trying to convince him that getting into the, getting into the, horse, the horse world would be more fun. Although, quite frankly, at this point, um, you know, having owned a couple of my own, not on the, not on the racing side, but uh, on the, the riding and, and show jumping side, I'm, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm better off if he stays out of it. Maybe I'm better off if he stays out, unless he can get into some claiming horses with my maker. Yeah. Now, Mike, uh, you worked for the legendary trainer D. Wayne Lucas uh, before you went out on your own. What are some of the things you learned from him? Oh, just everything. I mean, Wayne, you know, such a good horseman and, you know, organizational skills and just the way, uh, you know, handles people and everything. And just, you know, it's one of those things he was, uh, I was a fan of his when I was a kid and, uh, you know, be able to work for him was just uh, just great experience. And obviously.